Deepan Kar only and others through phone only. So I don't know the face and all. Sorry about that. And uh, they'll self introduce and they'll give you all the details you need. Right? Thank you. So please welcome, sir. Okay, so I am uh, Dibyandu Nandi from SESI Isaac Kolkata. So I just want to introduce this event. So this is being jointly done with the Aditya Support Cell at ARIES and the Astronomical Society of India Public Outreach and Education Committee. Uh, as you know that the Aditya mission has four primary institutions involved with it, but there are also multiple different organizations around the country uh, which have contributed to the mission. It's truly a, a national collaboration. Uh, so today in, in the outreach uh, event that is happening here and also in uh, the, the main uh, center, uh, multiple institutions have come together and helped us. I want to just acknowledge uh, those institutions. So we have, of course, ARIES, we have SESI, Isaac Kolkata, um, we have uh, Varuni uh, from IMSC who has been helping us the local logistics. Thank you to also the Science and Technology uh, Center here. and. Uh, Mr. Lenin for being very generous with this uh, facilities and taking the trouble of, of, of coordinating this uh, event. Event here, we have people from the University of Astrophysics. Um, I also believe that uh, that uh, that Durgesh and Ramprakash of Ayuka are coming in and on the way uh, from from Shiri Kota. They stayed overnight to take care of business there uh, from the launch center. So we might also be joined uh, by people from uh, from uh, Ayuka as well. Have I missed out anybody, Deepankar? I guess I have. There might be people from PR also dropping in. Yeah, people from Physical Research Laboratory might also be dropping in. Um, uh, we were expecting some people from ISRO, uh, but I think they're extremely tired and they had to do a lot of things post-launch also. Um, uh, so maybe that will be difficult today, but I hope that we can again come back sometime in the future and, and get uh, some scientists from ISRO as well. With that, um, it's a pleasure for me uh, to introduce uh, Deepankar, who is the director of ARIES and also, in fact, a solar physicist uh, who has been intimately associated with the, one of the payloads for a very long time, the, the variable so visible emission line coronagraph instrument that is primarily being built by IAA, also ISRO and various centers. And then subsequently, he moved to ARIES. Uh, he's also in the Aditya Science Working Group and he's an expert in the observations of the sun's outer atmosphere. Um, and uh, magnetic waves and reconnection events uh, in the corona. So with that, I will invite Deepankar to talk to you. Uh, online, it was told that I have to swap the displays. <laughs> Is it all right, Javed, now? Can you confirm? Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Oh, now... No, it's not good for the participants here. I have to I have to swap the display again. Uh, you have to switch off the presenter mode, sir. Switch off the presenter mode. Where is that? Uh, okay, let me stop share and then share again. And then should I just uh, share the desktop internet on desktop one? No, this is not good. Uh, because of the two different type of, you know, this is TV, this is projector. It gets confused uh, which way it should say. Ah, so here. Sir, when you yeah. share the display, don't share the screen. Just share the presentation. Okay, okay. Share the, yeah. Is this fine now? Oh, no. Yes, sir. For us, it is fine. Ah, but here it is not good, so that's a problem. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Sorry for the trouble. This is proof that we are not so prepared. You see? No, this place. So why can't you share this up for both? Yeah, no. Nah. That is usually what that means to be worked out. No, because of this, I know this is a uh, dual, screen. dual screen because there are two different types of screen. It gets confused. Uh, where is the uh, huh? one minute? Let's go to slide three. Yeah, one minute. So, no, because there are two different types now, so it's getting yeah. confused. Mirror on built in display. 
stop me running. No, that yes, will not work. No, no, no. But then it will not work at all. Oh, mirroring is required. No. Uh, just a minute. Just a minute. Uh, stop mirroring. Sir, it will hmm? work. Stop mirroring. It will work. Stop mirroring will not go into Zoom. I am get uh, live streaming it. Yeah, we can share the screen. After you think so? Okay. Just stop the uh, you know uh, live streaming for a while. No, no, only mirroring only. Stop. Just a minute. Display options. Yeah. Stop mirroring. You need to extend it now. You. Go to presentation mode. Go to the presentation. Okay, presentation. Okay. Yeah. I think. Sir, you are muted. Huh? Is my screen visible now? No, sir. Okay. Um... Sorry. Sorry for the technical difficulty. Uh, uh, click on these three dots. It will show the close the presenter view on the bottom where slide five and this. Pointer option now, which one? There is an option for closing the uh, this view. No, I think I can't bore people here too much. So <laughs> let me just live with it. <laughs> Sorry, sorry for the technical difficulty. I think we have to leave with it. Uh, you that proves that we are not very organized. We are all uh, still getting up from uh, yesterday's launch. So what I thought today is, you know, uh, I will try to give a brief intro about why do we do uh, need to study sun. And uh, my colleagues are there, so I will, you know, sort of uh, slowly request them to come uh, one after another. And as Dibendu uh, kindly, uh, you know, introduced me. I'm just a small soldier in many a big army, and there are many generals. So uh, please bear that you know uh, we are just doing our bit to reach out to you and uh, share our excitement. And so today's uh, session, the way we have arranged is to have more interactions. So uh, please, you know, I will try to uh, stop the presentation uh, sooner, and then uh, you know I have my younger colleagues. They will also make some presentations. Then you can move from this location to the main planetarium entrance where there is a lobby and there are also sunspot viewing and there are other younger colleagues. They will also explain uh, you know, why we study sun and more in exciting hands-on way and you will have an opportunity to interact with them. That's the idea for the whole day. It's very informal and we will not, uh, you know, uh, and please feel free to stop me anytime uh, as I uh, move on. So just one uh, quick uh, uh, comment that sun is our nearest star, but it is a very, you know, variable star. It means, you know, it changes all the time. We don't know about it. If you just look at the sun, it appears, you know, it, uh, it it's always bright and uh, sunny there. But uh, in the atmosphere of the sun, particularly, there are lots of dynamic changes happen, which can take, uh, you know, within few seconds, minutes, hours. So that's one kind of, you know, variability we see. Also, there is a longer term variability. Sun is a magnetic star and it undergoes, you know, a, a magnetic uh, evolution and it has a typical 11 year periodicity of its magnetic activity. So that 11 year periodicity also has its own influence. So uh, which is seen from last 400 years of data. So this is sunspot uh, number, uh, you know, which is uh, recorded for last 400 years from the ground based telescope. We didn't have the opportunity to go to space. And you see very clearly the sunspot number changes with time. And typically the periodicity is about 11 years, but sometimes the sunspots, uh, you know, there could be many in certain period. These are called, you know, active, uh, you know, and this last hundred years, you can see around 1950s, there was a solar cycle, which was very, uh, very, you know, strong. 
And there are other periods when things were much, much weaker. And of course, there were huge gaps in the uh, you know, data or there were no sunspot recorded. And there were direct effect of these in our climate and so on. So that's one kind of uh, you know, uh, science we need to understand. The other kind of uh, you know, science is the you know, violent sun. So uh, this is a sort of picture of uh, uh, the sun. And these regions where the sunspots are, uh, you know, they evolve with time. And as you can see, if I take images in multiple wavelengths, uh, namely, you know, if I want to see the different atmospheric layers, this is about 2000 kilometer above this surface. Uh, you see these, you know, places are all connected by huge structures. They are called magnetic loops. Uh, and this is another image taken from again space platform about 1,200 uh, to 500 kilometers, where the loop structures are slightly more compact and looks to be slightly cooler, whereas these loop structures are much, much uh, you know, brighter. So point is that these active regions, uh, which confines lots of plasma fill, uh, filled with strong magnetic field, they actually erupt. And when they erupt, they throw away a lot of material into the interplanetary space. They're called solar flares or coronal mass ejection, the effective uh, you know, output of that. And then we need to observe them. So those are smaller time scale variability, which can happen in seven minutes to you know, hours and days. So the physics is completely different. And uh, this is again a, a picture to show you that how you know, we need to really do multi-wavelength astronomy. So this is again a very important element. You have heard about AstroSat mission, uh, probably some of you which looks at multi wavelength uh, for uh, you know other uh, galactic uh, or uh, you know extra galactic sources here if you would have confined our observations from just optical telescope you know the sun would have looked a little boring you know you have just this one little sunspot here but if i go to high altitude mountain we start seeing some infrared observation and then from infrared you see how much details you can see and then if i go to to really in space I have a possibility of detecting the smaller wavelengths. You know, the electromagnetic spectrum is uh, depicted here. So the smaller wavelengths, namely the X-rays and the gamma rays, you know, they cannot penetrate Earth's atmosphere, thankfully. Otherwise, you would not have survived here. So uh, to see these X-ray emission, you have to go to space. And you see this huge complexity in the solar atmosphere. And once I, we understand this complexity, how it is evolving and all that, we can only understand the physics of it. So that's the sort of uh, realm with, you know, Aditya was launched. But before Aditya uh, is launched, I will again show you certain, you know, uh, data what we have from international uh, missions. Uh, you see how much details we have from, this is a movie from Solar Dynamic Observatory. And then you see, you know, this uh, huge explosion is throwing away interplanet a, a material uh, mass and energy, and then also with magnetic field which travels within the interplanetary space, some material falls back as well. But then now the question is, this is close to the sun. Now, if we go uh, slightly away from the sun, we see the same you know, material which is traveling. How we do that? We artificially block the solar disk because this emission is actually very, very weak. Uh, they're not as bright as uh, you know, when you look at very, uh, you know, on the disk. So this particular instrument is called coronagraph. It is like an artificial total solar eclipse. I don't know how many of you have experienced a total solar eclipse. That's a celestial uh, marvel. You know, what happens is that the moon perfectly blocks the solar disk. And during only totality, we see the outer atmosphere of the sun, which is the corona. Incidentally, the corona is one millionth time, you know, uh, fainter as compared to the solar disk. So unless the solar disk is perfectly blocked, you will not see this weak coronal emission. But again, total solar eclipse happens very rarely, once or twice a year, and you have to travel to many different parts of the globe. or you know, uh, So that's very difficult. So the idea is that you go to space and artificially you block the solar disk to have this uh, you know, corona observation all the time. Again, I will show one or two uh, you know, uh, recent things from another mission called Parker Solar Probe. You see, there is an ejecta, and how much material is thrown. Parker Solar Probe is a special mission because it is going much closer to the sun as compared to uh, uh, you know, our Aditya mission. It has traveled much, much closer to the sun, almost you know, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 AU already. So 
this is not a very pleasant environment. I'm sure nobody wants to be in that you know, area. Uh, forget about any uh, satellite or, 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 or humans. So we need to understand where these, uh, you know, uh, these CMEs are happening, why they're happening, and if they happen, then when they are likely to reach Earth or Earth's near environment. Because near Earth environment, we have so many satellites and, and so uh, many assets. This is again another movie from another uh, pair of uh, satellites from NASA called Stereo. So what you see here is that, you know, these material come from the sun and then, uh, you know, we are actually recording this with multiple instruments. Why I'm also trying to highlight is that one single instrument cannot actually get a composite picture or comprehensive understanding of any phenomena now. So to have a comprehensive understanding, it is necessary to have a multi-wavelength, you know, your own observatory, and then you also use the data from other observatories from space and ground, then only you will get a comprehensive understanding. So here you see this ejecta is traveling from, uh, this is the lower edge of the sun. Uh, and these are different instruments. This is an inner coronagraph. This is the two, you know, outer coronagraphs. And then, uh, you know, th there is an imaging uh, thing also, which is attached here. These two are called heliospheric imagers and so on. So basically, you know, we need multiple instruments. That is my uh, main message. Now, these guys are coming from the sun. Thankfully, Earth has its own magnetic field. And that is actually protecting us. If that guy would not have been there, if the Earth magnetic field would not have been there, we would have been directly affected. Our life uh, existence would have been difficult here. But thankfully, as I said, uh, you know, Earth has its magnetic field. If this uh, material which is coming from the sun, so far I have been talking about only the coronal mass ejection. There is also something called solar wind. It's basically outer expansion of the, you know, expansion of the outer atmosphere. Continuously, it is flowing away, you know, plasma material. That uh, also, it's like a, you know, you think about a river uh, and then the CME is on the top of that, you throw a stone. So depending on what velocity you will throw the stone, the you know the final trajectory of the stone will be dictated and so the depending on the velocity of the river so solar wind is here actually the background which is the river and the stone is like this you know cmes so we need to understand uh, the the river and the speed at which we are throwing the stone and the inclination at which we are throwing the stone i am sure all of you I, we did that uh, you know experiment a number of times when we were young and I'm sure you have done that uh, story same as well. So all these phenomena basically are responsible for this beautiful thing. I do not know. I mean, from India, you don't see this uh, farther north or farther south you go. You have a possibility of seeing this phenomena called aurora. These are nothing but highly energetic particles which comes from the sun. But they are normally not able to cross the magnetic field lines of the earth. So uh, in the previous uh, slide, when I showed you that these magnetic field lines don't allow the particles to cross. So what they will do is they will try to gyrate about the magnetic field lines and try to enter from the polar side because there is a, almost like a gap and the particles uh, try to enter into the Earth's atmosphere and they interact with Earth's uh, lower atmosphere and you get this uh, you know, uh, little chemistry there and uh, beautiful auroras are formed. But Apart from these beautiful auroras, you have problems uh, in terms of day-to-day uh, -day, uh, our operations. These uh, huge cloud of material which is coming from the sun, they interact with our, you know, our assets closer to uh, uh, the you know Earth's magnetic shield. First of all, it affects our magnetic field for a few minutes to uh, you know uh, hours. That is called the geomagnetic storms, and that directly impacts our communication system. It impacts our electrical power system because it, use, you know, it can induce current and then our transformers and all that can get uh, damaged. You have a disruption of your uh, navigation system, the GPS, your WhatsApp may not be delivered in time because the communication is uh, uh, interrupted. Your TV program, the, uh, yeah, the Pakistan cricket match, which was anyway uh, hampered by weather, but uh, would have stopped by communication failure as well. So all these uh, things, you know, is called a term called space weather. 
and uh, this is a sort of you know global view how you know this uh, solar uh, you know impact is affecting our day to day life because as you know the earth's atmosphere ionosphere is very much important for our communications so it directly impacts the ionosphere it directly impacts the you know different satellites if an astronaut is uh, you know uh, like you know going there to repair some instrument on a telescope uh, or to the space station then it can get, uh, get directly affected there is also you know atmospheric drag what happens is when such a huge uh, you know solar storm is traveling through interplanetary space it affects or uh, disturbs the solar uh, you know solar wind as well suppose you know we launch a satellite there is a you know precise calculation in terms of its trajectory but the trajectory is again through a medium right as i was giving example of this uh, you know river and the throwing the stone it is similar the uh, it is assumed that the atmosphere has certain you know velocities and so on in fact even yesterday's launch when we were observing we were all very tense uh, that you know of course the weather was very good so always there is a you know a big follow up of the weather conditions also important but the solar conditions are also important incidentally more than a year back spacex this is a private company in uh, us they launched uh, 40 satellites and all of them were lost they were destroyed because they didn't account for the changes in the uh, trajectory because of the atmospheric drag and that drag was induced by you know solar storms it was not very big so they uh, they didn't worry about it but you know even a moderate size solar storm can impact the trajectories so there are n number of uh, you know things where we have to uh, you know worry about now quickly get into our aditya mission before my colleagues uh, take over we started uh, you know long back so what is plotted here is a solar cycle so we call it solar cycle this is the sunspot number huh? so you see uh, there is a maxima then there is a minima we started talking about a coronagraph uh, way back in 2006 for a low earth orbit but then uh, and the low earth orbit uh, you know coronagraph was almost under development and so on then there was a sudden change and this all happened because of professor u r rao and the small satellite program was expanded to a huge observatory class mission for Lagrange and one. And uh, then we started, you know, there was an announcement of opportunity, many, many institutions and, you know, uh, they proposed different payloads after uh, quite a bit of a review and so on. Seven payloads were uh, selected and, uh, you know, the community has been working for these seven payloads for last, uh, you know, uh, almost a solar cycle. <laughs> And of course, we had COVID challenge during minimum. Finally, finally, we, the payloads were delivered and we had a launch yesterday. So that's the solar history. How did we, uh, you see this uh, trajectory? We experienced all this, uh, you know, yesterday. So uh, it was a, a very nice, uh, perfect lift off from Sri Horikota and then with a certain separation and burning stages and so on. About an hour later, you know, this spacecraft was separated from the, uh, from the launcher and that was the moment and after that you saw you know uh, there was cheer and the, the chairman and the others uh, you know came out uh, during the public and the congratulators so now we are traveling we are traveling uh, we are going through this orbit so basically this orbit very similar to Chandrayaan so we will uh, expand we'll expand and then eventually there will be a slingshot and we'll be uh, taking off from here so that's uh, likely to happen around 18 September uh, and then we will be traveling for almost four months. So this is called the cruise phase. And there is a, one more very important maneuver, which is called the halo orbit insertion. I will talk about what is uh, halo orbit at, around Lagrangian 1. You have heard that we are going to Lagrangian 1. That's a point here. And we are going to make a huge halo orbit around uh, you know, Lagrangian 1. This insertion is a very critical maneuver. Uh, of course, India has not done it uh, before. Uh, uh, only European Space Agency and NASA has been successfully, uh, you know, executed that. So that's a huge, huge challenge. As you have all heard, we were uh, really, really uh, waiting for the soft landing of the uh, of the moon. Uh, so this is again another uh, technically very challenging maneuver, and uh, we are all keeping our fingers crossed that uh, we'll be successfully able to achieve that. Thanks to ISRO that, you know, ISRO is taking up this kind of fantastic uh, mission challenge. 
So what is in uh, Lagrangian one point? Essentially, uh, Lagrangian one point is a imaginary uh, point in space. Here is Earth, here is Sun. So this is called Lagrangian one. In a two body system, you can have a two body system like uh, you know Earth and Sun. You can have five Lagrangian one point. So this point, once you reach there, basically, you know, in space, we, we make a, you know, uh, either a circular or a elliptical orbit. So here it will be a, a huge uh, halo orbit and it's not on one plane. It's actually going to be, you know, on a different plane, but essentially for any central, uh, you know, motion, you need a centripetal force. So that centripetal force will be balanced by the gravitational pull between the satellite and the earth and the force between the sun and the satellite. So this is somewhat a, a, a reasonably stable position. Once you reach there, you don't have to you know, spend too much of fuel. So that's the main advantage of going to L1. Your life can be much longer. And also, of course, you have a direct view of the sun 24 by 7, 365 days. That's a big thing as well, because if you have a low Earth orbit, then uh, you, know, you have, uh, because of the inclination, Sometimes Earth will block uh, the solar uh, view, so you'll have eclipses. So, uh, so that way also the Lagrangian one position is uh, very, very important. The other very important point of the Lagrangian one is that anything coming from the sun, before it reaches Earth, it has to pass through the around Lagrangian one point. So you have a possibility of remotely looking at the sun and also doing measurements. We call it in situ measurements of the material which is coming from the sun. Because now we are interested in all these, you know, huge, uh, you know, magnetic clouds which are coming uh, and they will be, uh, you know, uh, be possible to be think. I should also point out that this kind of mission does need sometimes, you know, some support for operations and all that. So this is a, a slide which I found from the European Space Agency also. There is some ground station, like, you know, you know even yesterday, after our launch, uh, several hours, uh, you see, we don't have a contact, so we don't know where it is. So just to know all, all that, so we, we were told that it was from the Fiji Island, we got the, you know, uh, response that the satellite is there and traveling in the right direction. So likewise, we will uh, be, uh, European Space Agency is going to support our, you know, tracking of the satellite. So uh, here it is again. I did not mention about uh, the L2. Uh, the L2 is again another uh, very, very nice uh, vantage point for particularly for astronomical observations. So the James Webb telescope, you know, uh, recently was la launched, which is primarily looking at uh, lots of uh, infrared. And then our own uh, L uh, Aditya is going out there. So these are uh, fancy you know, animations done by our students. So we are going to look at uh, around this uh, Lagrangian one point. And the other uh, Lagrangian one point, which are very important for solar observation is, one is L5, which is in the side. So the advantage of going to L5 is that, you know, uh, sun rotates like this. So once these sunspots and active regions, you know, are in the side, we can't see them. So we are only seeing them after say five, six days when they're in our you know line of sight. So having a L5 mission gives you a very early, you know, messages that you know, this guy is developing and so on. So this is very good for space weather and understanding the evolution of this magnetic field and so on. So L5 mission is big. And in, in fact, uh, we must point out that we started thinking about next. So we are thinking always big. So the next uh, mission, you never know, we can go to you know somewhere. So I will not actually, I will skip uh, some of these slides. Uh, there are uh, you know several um, posters about the different payloads and all that. My last uh, but one slide is that uh, we, have, we have made Aditya support cell. My Our idea is that, and also ISRO particularly is keen to increase the user community. See, the people who build the instrument, they know uh, what to look for. And uh, for them, it is somewhat easier to analyze the data and so on. But that's not enough. It's a, it's a national uh, mission. In fact, it's an international mission. The international community is looking for the spatial data which is supposed to come from this uh, mission. So we need to train much more, you know, younger population. So that is one of the reasons that you know we are going out to different parts of India and having training workshops and so on. So please uh, look at our website. We have regular uh, training programs and and so on. And uh, we are looking forward uh, for uh, some of you if you are interested in Aditya mission, learning about 
the scientific data analysis and how to you know submit a proposal because this is observatory class you have to submit a proposal to get some data and so on and uh, that's my last slide uh, that's the team from there we had uh, lots of pictures taken yesterday which probably you will see it in the open lobby uh, and uh, jai hind thank you for your attention from this beautiful place where i am So what I propose is before you know my uh, younger colleagues take over, uh, we can take questions, which is very important. Uh, so I will be happy to answer. Please feel free to you know ask questions. We have colleagues, and as Dipendu pointed out, uh, we you are only seeing very few individuals here. Many more are there in the main uh, lobby area or in the entrance of the planetarium. So I would request all of you to move uh, after these uh, talks are over to that. So that the others can come in here. So we will be, you know, swapping uh, people to get uh, more uh, exposure on uh, the termination. Yeah. Please uh, feel free to ask uh, some questions now, and uh, then we will uh, will invite uh, Chitpadeep. Yeah. 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 Y
depending on the energy or the mass of this particular and the and the velocity at which we can say that what time it will impact our earth's magnetosphere if there are certain assets in the space we can say i mean suppose you are making it taking a flight to us going through the polar region you can be affected because the polar uh, you know nowadays to make a shortcut they don't go by europe they go above greenland to shorten the distance so those flight the people passengers in the flight is also uh, vulnerable to these particles which are coming so that way there are definite impact and if uh, there is a huge geomagnetic storms if these plasma blob can penetrate even deeper our uh, you know our you know our electrical systems can get affected there were blackouts in canada in extreme winter there were blackouts for several hours and the the insurance companies had to pay out say few billions of damages so in uh, western world actually these are very very important uh, you know uh, exercise because there is a direct impact of it. so these are short time impact of course i very briefly mentioned in the beginning that there are longer time impact also suppose the radiation which is coming from the sun tomorrow reduces there is 0.1% of deviation we know with the solar cycle but if it is more than that our climate will also have some effect uh, either it could be global warming it could be global cooling so we need to understand all that so there are uh, serious direct impact in our lifetime yeah good question yeah yeah one more question uh, there yeah the mic is coming sir uh, actually we have shown some images about the sun, uh, sun sir like in different wavelengths sir so while we saw in the optical wavelength the sunspots were actually dark so does that mean that uh, the sunspots do not emit uh, light at that wavelength, but they emit in infrared, gamma, and uh, alpha wave alone, sir? Okay, good question. I mean, you have uh, many different elements uh, included in that. So first of all, in visible wavelength, why the sunspot uh, appears dark? There are two reasons for that. First is, you see the uh, the sun is a very you know very dynamic body. Inside that there is convection. Hmm? The energy is propagated by convection inside the sun, last 30%. When magnetic field, strong magnetic is present, then this convection is uh, somewhat halted or sort of inhibited. It, it is not so efficient. So the energy which is coming from underneath the sun, uh, as compared to the sunspot, if you look at, you know, in the surrounding, it is much brighter. So here, the energy is something, somewhat absorbed. So that's why it is... Uh, there is also another reason, which is a corollary almost. These sunspots region are cooler than the surrounding because there is a strong magnetic field. Uh, there is a pressure balance and all that is required. So the plasma temperature is cooler. So that's why, you know, they are cooler. So the darkness of the sunspot is because of that. In terms of, uh, you know, other energy emission, what you're talking about, see, the emission strongly depends on the temperature of the plasma. The hotter and hotter the uh, plasma temperature, you have shorter and shorter wavelengths uh, emission. So these sunspots are actually connected by these big tubes. They're called magnetic flux tubes in our theoretical modeling. And these tubes, as they go up in the atmosphere, the plasma is much hotter. And that time they will actually emit in shorter wavelengths. And if there is a huge uh, flare and all that, you can get even, you know, gamma rays and all that. So, like, uh, this uh, hot spots are AR where uh, the light, light is mostly infrared region because it's cooler due to the recent temperature. But during mass ejections, we can uh, observe this uh, hotness further away from sun when they are emitted. Even other time also, you will be able to see it. So, that's why, you know, all these images which I was showing here, uh, for example, here, you see this, uh, you know, loop structures which are connected to the sunspots only. So these are sunspot underneath and these loop structures are there. These are UV images uh, and representing about a million Kelvin plasma. Yes, thank you. Okay. Good question. So it seems to have, you know, so which are the, what standard you are in? I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, uh, you are in high school, college. I'm College, sir. I, Very I good. Yes. Second, what uh, subject area? What, sir? Subject area. I mean, aeronautical. Sir. Aeronautical. Okay. Yes. So you want to fly? Good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What about this lady? She asked the question. Which background you are from? 
Very good, very good. Except there were five diagrammatic points. How do they exactly classify them? Classify that. I can't say how, I mean, probably I have to ask Lagrange <laughs> why the order was uh, five. I really do not know uh, what made him uh, think about uh, as a one, two, three, four sequence. Um, because I don't see the distance also could be a criteria. Yeah, because you see L3 is probably the farthest. So I don't think it is, uh, I, I don't know, uh, but I don't think there is a logic of any numbering if you are just asking that. But as I indicated here, so L1 is uh, the sun earth line here, L3 is behind sun. So uh, although it will be a you know, fantastic location for solar observation because we can then see the backside of the sun, but unfortunately we don't have any telemetry to download any data. So L3 is not so uh, useful for space exploration, but um, L5 and L4 are very good vantage points for solar observation. And as I indicated, L2 is again, uh, you know, Herschel is there, James Webb is there. Uh, also it protects from the sun light uh, so it can be kept at the cooler temperature. So that's also uh, because it has now infrared observations. So classical. It's just to know, you know, like, you know, if there are five people, you know, have a roll number no, in the class. <laughs> if, uh, if individuals has to be identified, uh, I think sometimes the numbering is uh, required. No? If you have two rooms, lecture rooms, you say this one, one, the next one, two. Yeah, yeah, there is a question there. Yeah, so the sun, when it ejects the coronal heat waves, it affects the Aditya. So how does it handle those heat waves? So, I mean, since you use this uh, terminology, heat waves, I do not, I did not set up, say, a heat wave. It's a magnetic cloud, uh, which does carry, and of course, it is a plasma blob. It will have some temperature, but it is not as hot as you think. Because a Lagrangian one point is still 99% distance away from the sun. If, uh, you know, if the sun, sun earth distance is 150 million, we are only traveling 1.5 million kilometer. That is 1% of the distance. So uh, these plasma blobs, the, the pictures which you have seen, it is true that, you know, that million plasma is thrown, but uh, they're very, very thin also. So uh, the concept of the heat, what you have in your mind by seeing those pictures, uh, when it arrives, actually it doesn't make that kind of impact to directly. So the heat is not a uh, major issue, but the particles, they have high energies and so on and so forth. They do impact. But of course, you know, our intention is to detect those particles. So that's why we are going to Lagrangian one point. So uh, to some extent, your question has a very important uh, implication is, so when we build such instruments, we have to test them with such highly energetic particles. Otherwise, these systems will get damaged. So in, in fact, in the laboratory, they are bombarded with uh, you know, high energy particles. We have, we have laboratory, we have in TIFR certain laboratories. So certain components are hardened with this kind of radiation. Yeah. Thank you. There's a question in the back. How long is it designed last space? Good point. So uh, we call it nominal mission is five years. That means minimum we expect it to be alive there for five years. But uh, we scientists always think uh, more positively and we expect it to last for uh, more than one solar cycle. That is <laughs> 11 years. Incidentally, the SOHO satellite from European Space Agency was uh, launched in 1995. It is still alive. But having said that, all the instruments are not uh, performing in its same potential because it's uh, much too long to uh, survive. So uh, depending on our you know, life of the other instruments uh, and so on, uh, we hope that we'll be there for 10 years. But the nominal mission lifetime is five years. So you told that the L1 point is unstable, right? So what is the L1 point? So we are not staying there. Nah? So that's the point. See, we are not, it's, first of all, it's the imaginary point. It's like, you know, uh, your mathematician's uh, concept. But uh, we are, you know, that's why we are revolving around the Lagrange. So in space, it is very hard to stay in one place. You can't. 
so you choose certain uh, locations where you have to spend less fuel that either use certain uh, you know uh, certain gravitating object like you know you have a orbiter around moon or a mars and things like that but here it is a, a imaginary space once you reach there you know it is providing you naturally you know a, a easier lifetime that's the advantage Uh, any other questions? Yeah, there is uh, one there and one here. Yeah, just tell you the young boy. So, so which said, which class you are? Which class you are from? Ninth standard. Ninth standard. Which school? Baby Academy Senior Secondary School. Very nice. Okay. Sir, Let's. What's so VELC, sir. What is the use of VELC? So first of all, we should uh, know what is it VELC. So VELC is full form is Visible Emission Line Corona Graph. So it is a coronagraph, as I indicated uh, in my early slides. It artificially blocks the solar disk and allows us to see the corona, which is the outer atmosphere of the sun. We have four cameras in that uh, instrument or that telescope. Three cameras in the visible wavelength range. So that's why the visible has come. Now, from in the corona, since it is in a very high temperature, the certain elements are in a very highly ionized state. Huh? A element goes into, you know, 10th ionization state or 11th ionization state. And then, you know, once you go to a higher uh, state, you can come down to the lower state and then can get that emission. So it's called emission line for particular, uh, you know, elements. So we have a, uh, a way of particularly imaging the corona in those emission lines through a spectroscopic method. So if you have seen a spectrum, so in that, you get uh, these particular, you know, different lines formed at different wavelengths. So if I can image it or see that particular spectral line, I can identify or I can also even talk about what is the temperature, what is the density, you know, what is the pressure in that region. So these are called plasma diagnostics. So we can do all that. Also, we are attempting to measure the magnetic field in the corona through a a process called spectropolarimetry. You see, light is also polarized. No, I, you are too young to un, uh, probably understand polarization and all that. But for the general, I'm saying light also has a polarization property. So if you can use that, you know, information, you can get a sense of magnetic field of the emitting plasma region. So this corona graph will work in visible emission line and with visible camera and this magnetic field measurement will be done in an infrared uh, camera. So that's all is about VLC. But I would suggest that we'll have full team. If you are interested in more on VLC, you have to you know, interact with experts are here. They will, they, will, uh, they will tell you more about it. Okay? Sir, I have another doubt, sir. The sun makes the heat increase, sir. It will be useful when we brought it to the earth, sir. Yeah, I think we have to still wait for you to grow and uh, have a uh, possibility of, you know, getting something out of sun and you know, it's a great idea, but, uh, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to think about, uh, you know, getting that plasma from the sun uh, because it's much too away. Having said that, if there is a situation where this, uh, I don't know, this magnetic cloud is carrying some helium-3, uh, and you are somewhere in space, you can catch it, uh, that will be uh, probably possibility, yeah. But it's probably uh, far away from us as, as, as the technology stands. Yeah. Yes, sir. yeah. There was a question here. So next question. Uh, hi, sir. I'm Kate Vasan from uh, Jigopal Garadia, Hindu Vidyalaya. I'm studying at 11th standard. So, you mentioned that these five Lagrange points are one and ten real for L5. You said that they are moving in a three dimensional space. It's not like a fixed point. But if we consider a point, it only has a position. You can't consider its dimension. So, how can you actually call these five points points? Um... A singularity, I mean, I have to probably, uh, you know, take you to a little more mathematics. These are called also singularity points. You know, there are certain mathematical concepts where, uh, you know, you have minimum energy uh, conditions and so on. So any, why can't you have a, uh, you know, point in a three-dimensional space? Why not? 
what what prohibits uh, you to have a point in a three dimensional space you see if you it doesn't prohibit huh? so you can have a point in a three dimensional space uh, but once sometimes you know it happens that the points are connected by a loci and then you have a sheet or layer so there are certain other mathematical topological conditions where these things happens but uh, here it is a point it is not a, a you know uh, not a very extended region yeah Obviously. yeah Thank you. sir since there are five Lagrange points, why did you choose that uh, L1 point particularly? Okay, so that's a very relevant question. So as you see from this image itself, this is sitting here, sun earth line, right? Sun, whatever, you know, if you want to continuously look at the sun, Lagrange one point is a very good location. L2 is not good because uh, earth blocks it. Of course, L4 and L5 is good, but it's even farther away, <laughs> even farther away. So first let us do L1. And then we will think about going to L4 or L5. Yeah? So this is ideally suited because we have a continuous viewing of the sun and anything coming from the sun before it reaches out, we will be able to uh, detect that. So it's a perfect vantage point. Good evening, sir. Yeah. I am from Malta University. So my question is, sir, why is Aditya L1 is important? Yeah, uh, so Aditya L1 uh, is important because it is the first observatory class mission with uh, many different payloads uh, in combination of all these, you know, I was referring to the VLC, what he's talking about. There is an instrument which is going to look at the sun, full disk, which is called suit. Some of it you will hear today. And if you interact more with other people, you will know more about the instruments. We have further details about this instrument. All these are going to look at the sun continuously and uh, study its behavior in short time scale, in long time scale, and so on. So this will give us a better understanding about the phenomena which is happening in the sun. See, entire uh, globe wants to study the sun. We are a bit late, and uh, we are lucky that ISRO has given this opportunity to have an observatory in space. So sun studying the sun is, is very, very important for our existence. Sir, another yeah. question. Sir, how many countries already gone there, sir? Yeah. So it's a European Space Agency. Uh, European Space Agency works in a way that there are several European countries which are part of that. So we can't say country. It is a space agency which represents many countries from Europe and NASA. Uh, NASA is primarily, uh, you know, American. But NASA also has collaborations with, you know, other developing countries like Japan and so on. Thank you, A young boy, yeah. Good morning, sir. I'm Shushan Mishra of Class 8 B. I'm from Amon School. Will there be any... Okay, so if is there any point that Aditya L1 will be close to the sun? No, we are going to be uh, much away from the sun, and we are going to be always at that, around that distance, 99% uh, away. So we are only going, as I'm indicated very clearly, we are going 1.5 million kilometer, the distance from there to this, you just subtract uh, 150 minus 1.5, that much. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Yeah. I'm Arjun Marwan. I'm studying in JJP school, sir. I'm studying in London Standard. My question is, what is Halo's uh, orbit? Halo orbit is, you see, uh, as I again, this is a... Uh, projected in the plane huh? but as i was pointing out it is essentially a 3d orbit so it's not always you know just a single uh, uh, you know ellipse it has a slightly changing of its eccentricity and so on so that is termed as a hello orbit normally uh, elliptic orbits are referred to as hello but this is slightly different from a standard ellipse also if the ellipse is Probably Shuva will know. Uh, it's almost like a Lissajous figure. It is going to form. Thanks. Uh, question. Yeah, the lady. Someone, sir. I'm Sanya from SIVT College. So you forgot your question, <laughs> or? 
Now, okay. Yeah, I mean, you can, if you can remember, it is okay. Ah, okay. Okay, session. You said that uh, European nation and US uh, are succeeded in uh, space research about sun. So, what is the reason behind uh, their success, sir? Their success is they have tried uh, much uh, before us, and uh, we will also succeed tomorrow. Uh, we just started a little late because we were a poor country, right, as compared to yes, the developed world. Success comes from uh, in attempts. We have not even attempted. We are just first time attempting to go to space and having a, a space observatory. We have done a lot of solar research from this country from based on ground-based uh, you know, observations. Kodakinal Observatory has been looking at the sun more than 100 years. There are a lot of scientific uh, you know, results from that. But we did not have our own uh, space observatory. See, there are scientists from this uh, country, people sitting and, and those who are going to, they're all working with the solar data from NASA or ESA missions or Japanese mission, because they give us the data and we work on that. But uh, it's always good to have your own, right? So, uh, and we are fortunate that it, the, the time has come, that we are doing a lot of things on our own now. Atma Nirbhar Bharat. So, good morning all. Good morning, sir. I'm Shivani. Well, uh, I appreciate all the people who asked the question. Like, it was really logical. Well, I'm a board trigger, to be honest. It's kind of off the topic, but uh, how do you guys feel, like the scientist people, feel when you launch the rocket? Because even when I do a simple project, I always have the fear of failing somehow. So, is will you guys like, feel the fear of it crashing, or how do you feel? Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, if you are dedicated, if you are sincere, always you worry about the results. Uh, this is a natural thing. Uh, it appears that you know you are a sincere person. That's why you have also uh, the worry for failure. But this is a, of course, human. Uh, you know, we have to build ourselves. We have to look at uh, you know the success which is happening around us, and you see how many people are getting successful, right? And we are not doing bad. So there are many things, you know, Chandrayaan is such a great success, right? Of course. So look at the good things happening around you and uh, be a little more confident. Of course, uh, having said that, we also get our attention, but we, we try to think as positive as possible. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. Uh, hello, sir. I hope you're having a good day. Um, I'm Shamita from KR on Public School, and I'm studying in 12th grade. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say that your presentation was really amazing and I enjoyed every bit of it. Uh, my question is, um, how many AUs are all these points away from us? How many AUs? So this is, as I said, the Lagrangian 1 is already at point, uh, you know, 99 uh, AU uh, because it's just 1%. 1 AU is the sun at distance. So I do not, I, frankly, I do not directly remember the numbers of the L5 or L4. I have to dig that out. You can, you can calculate, yeah. You can calculate from these uh, diagrams and all that. Rough as estimate you can get. Of course, L4 and L5 both are much closer. You can uh, you can imagine from this diagram itself. Yeah, Thank yeah. Thank you for your compliment. This uh, means a lot for us. Good, so, good morning, sir. Uh, the sun's outer atmosphere is hotter than the inner atmosphere, right? So there are a lot of theories stating that. Is there any particular theory that your scientists believe? <laughs> Very good. So you have done your homework also. Nice. So uh, as I briefly indicated that the outer atmosphere of the uh, sun, namely the chromosphere and the corona, is hotter than the surface. And this is, has been a mystery. Uh, and this problem is called coronal heating. So the question is, so any normal thermodynamics cannot explain. So some non-thermal processes will be responsible for that. So to be honest, uh, early 90s, I started my PhD and my first uh, project uh, was on coronal heating and I'm still working on it. So uh, that means that we have understood uh, quite a bit, quite a lot in fact, but still we have not reached a stage where it is a complete understanding. Now, I think there is a very good consensus among the scientists that there are two major uh, processes which are believed to be responsible for coronal heating. One is uh, based on reconnection. These are called magnetic reconnection. 
because you know the atmosphere is heavily uh, you know magnetic you know all these plasmas they are confined because of the presence of the magnetic field so in some way if you can normally magnetic field do not like to talk to each other they repel but if you can force them to come closer the magnetic connectivity and uh, the you know uh, the topology and so on it changes and the magnetic energy gets converted into heat and kinetic energy so that is the process called magnetic reconnection and now we know magnetic reconnections do take place in the sun from very small scales to medium scales to very large scales so the large ones are the bigger flares the smaller ones uh, are the smaller flares so that's the reason actually since you asked the question in aditya l1 we have two x-ray spectrometers which are going to primarily looking at these very very tiny small flares and very large flares also two two uh, instruments are there so that we can see that how much energy is carried by the small guys the middle guys and that and that you know big fellows so this combination will give us an understanding whether we have sufficient energy to hit the corona there is also an alternate uh, uh, complementary now uh, we call it uh, mechanism which is called the wave heating essentially in the solar surface you have a possibility of generating lot of waves because it's a you know it's a continuously disturbed surface uh, like you know I, I i clap i create a sound wave so if you have a convection on the outer surface then it creates a lot of sound waves but then sound waves gets modified because of the presence of the magnetic field so these waves are of magnetic in nature and these waves can carry the energy from the lower atmosphere to the higher atmosphere and then dump the energy in the higher atmosphere namely the corona so now among the scientists these two uh, you know processes namely the magnetic reconnection and waves are believed to be responsible for coronal heating but still we do not get the full budget the full requirement that's why we are still you know devising new instruments to account for all forms of you know energy sources and you know get a complete picture and understanding Thank you, sir. Sir, L1 distance is 1.5 million kilometer. Can we able to move near? If possible, uh, what modification we need to do? Why do we uh, want to go near? First, you have to tell me that. Near means, you know, the low Earth orbit is there. We don't want to stay near because we want to be uh, close to it. So, they, as I indicated again and again, Lagrangian one point is a suitable vantage point because you don't need to you know, uh, spend that much of fuel if you can reach there. Otherwise, you have to always move. That means your life cannot be five years. It will be only one or two years. Yeah, so that's the main reason that we want to go to Lagrangian Thank you, sir. Uh, Sanjay, so probably I will take, uh, yeah, 12, 20, we will swap. Maybe, you know, you can come over and connect things. Maybe you can try do, doing that while I ask the question. Yeah. I mean, answer the question rather. Try to answer the question. I will stop share. Can you join the? Yeah. Javid, you can stop this or pause this thing now. Yeah. Yeah, you can set it up. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Ask your question. Yes, sir. Uh, are there like any mistakes in the future? Like uh, we have geosynchronous orbits, right, sir? So similarly, we have sun synchronous orbits. So like uh, suppose we send uh, like a set of satellites to sun synchronous orbits such that uh, we have such a point that suppose six or eight satellites such that they have angular uh, diameters that they can cover the entire sun. Right? Are there any missions like that, sir, in the past or at least are there in the future? Okay. Uh, since you asked the question, um, there are there are quite a few mission internationally, not from India. This is our first. We wish that in the future we will have such possibilities. What you are trying to say is these are called constellation of uh, you know uh, uh, of uh, satellites, and that there could be a mother uh, you know satellite which will connect to this. There is a mission called Punch, uh, which is an approved mission. Twenty twenty five. It is supposed to launch. I'm also part of that mission actually from NASA and uh, that will attempt to look at the corona and heliosphere with this constellation concept. So there will be four such, uh, you know, uh, smaller satellites, we call it sometimes micro satellites and so on. So there are uh, such uh, programs which are already approved in, Euro I mean, international scenario. 
from india also such possibilities do exist and after lagrangian uh, one you know sort of you know uh, success uh, we are you know in the process of uh, started talking about next you guys should quickly uh, do all the uh, you know primary uh, studies and join in these discussions Sir, are those satellites launched in sun synchronous orbit, sir? No, they're not sun synchronous. Sun synchronous is again a big thing uh, because it is also far away. Yes, sir. Yeah, these are mostly uh, lower. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. And sir, uh, one more thing, sir. Can we know about like your experience, like uh, your career, and how you got into this? Uh, <laughs> okay, I am a, a sort of very common uh, person from Kolkata. Studied from a government school in Bengali medium. Uh, people do not like to these days go for a vernacular language, but I studied from a Bengali medium school called Baliganj Government High School, then studied uh, my physics honors from St. Xavier's College, then subsequently from Calcutta Science College, uh, physics uh, MSc. I didn't have any astrophysics until my MSc, then went to Bangalore. I did my PhD from Indian Institute of Astrophysics, uh, Bangalore, and uh, subsequently spent some years in Europe and uh, back in India and as a faculty at IA for uh, some years. Just last three years, I've moved to ADS as a director and probably I will be back in IA in after a year. That's fine. Nice. Yeah. I think that will be the last question. That will be the last question and I will, I will request. Uh, Your board, so please carry on. Good what afternoon, I will... <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah. Myself, I'm Anushree from Physics Department at Stella Maris College. So, uh, most of the payloads in Aditya L1 are being covered with the gold foils. So, I would like to know why is it covered with the gold foil? Yeah, good point. So, the gold foil is also to uh, protect it from the contamination because this particle also does a hit. And uh, contamination is again not good because. Uh, the dust and any particulate com contamination uh, sort of affects uh, uh, the life also. So to protect these uh, things, you know, the gold foil is a perfect uh, reflector and so on. So that's why they are used. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Oh, good, good morning. This is Aruna Sudhai from Medha Christian College. Okay. So, I would like to know more about the coronal mass ejection. Okay, uh, so I have a PhD student who passed and he's a, he's a successful postdoc now. So I will uh, divert that question. So what I, let, let's do it this way. I'm going to be around. Huh? I'm going to be around. Let's have these, uh, you know, next presentation. And uh, I will hang around and you can ask me questions because, you know, after that, I would expect you to go to the other uh, section also. You can get a new perspective as well. Uh, and I do have some knowledge, but it's uh, always... Uh, uh, finite and limited. So it will be good to interact with uh, many more people. Okay. Yeah. So let's have, uh, yeah. You connected, no? Yeah. Hello, sir. Uh, we are just moving into the next. I will take your question later on, huh? after the presentations are over. Okay. What a beautiful question and session it was. And what a beautiful work you know, for your start son. Vanakam, um, this is Chitra, a PhD student from the Institute of Science Education and Research, Kolkata. Also, I'm a, a student member of Astronomical Society of India. We have the president of Astronomical Society of India. We have the chairperson of the Public Office Education Committee, uh, Professor Kudanamangi, also. Basically, today I'm preparing.